Anytime anything happens of a negative nature, we are prone to ask the question, why? Why, Lord? I'm tempted to ask you if you've ever done that, but I know better. So I'm going to ask, when was the last time you did that? It takes sometimes a major catastrophe to happen, but sometimes it's just uh, less than catastrophe. And we're just prone to ask the question, why? Now, the answer to that is um, sometimes complex. I think I could give you a whole list of reasons from the scripture of why the Lord allows things to happen. What I want to do today is focus on one option, one possibility. But I want you to understand before we look at it, it is by no means the only one. It may not even be the major one. But it's there and it happens and we need to consider it. We've been going through the little book of First Samuel and we've come to chapter 4 where that very question was asked and I think given an answer. So look with me, if you will, at First Samuel chapter 4. Look at verse 1. 1 Samuel Chapter 4, verse 1. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped by Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped by Elphick. All right, this verse is sort of giving us the setting and it's simply telling us a couple of things that were going on. For example... Samuel has now become a nationally known prophet. And that's the point of the first. The word of the Lord came to all Israel. We've looked at him so far as he was young. Now all of a sudden he is grown. He's a man. He's a prophet. And he's a nationally known prophet. But rather than develop that, the text immediately tells us and Israel was going to battle with the Philistines. Now this happened roughly around 1200 BC, which is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Philistines came to the land around 1200 uh, BC, which was about 100 years before this chapter. They came into Canaan and they were a constant pest to Israel. As a matter of fact, in 1st and 2nd Samuel, there are 150 references just to the Philistines. They were a constant thorn in the flesh. You remember Samson fought with them even before this. At any rate, this is sort of the setting. Now, the text tells us what happened next. Look at verse 2. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. So the plot thickens. Now we have a battle enjoined and Israel loses. They not only lose the battle, they lose 4,000 men. The little phrase translated 4,000 can be referred to a, liter, a military unit which might be a little less than 1,000, but at any rate, a large number of uh, Philistine, uh, Israeli soldiers were killed. Now, what do you do then? This is the kind of situation where you start asking the question, uh, uh, why, Lord, you know? Uh, let me tell you the other thing that often happens when this happens. The other thing you do is say, uh, it's time to get religious, right? Uh, even people that aren't Christians do that. It's called foxhole religion. That when something goes terribly wrong, then it's time to get religion. And that is exactly what they did. Look at verse 3. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? There it is, the question, 
Why did the Lord let this happen? 4,000, maybe less, people were killed. Why did the Lord let that happen? So now they're going to get religion. The latter part of verse 3 says, Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, what's the next word in your text? No, no, you skipped the word. Who will save us? It will save us from the hand of the enemy. All right. Let's just start with a question. Why were they defeated? Now, you can just give all kinds of answers to that. Perhaps they were defeated because they were not prepared for battle. And there's all kinds of uh, explanations beyond that. At any rate, the elders in their brilliance decide, well, let's bring the ark from Shiloh. Now, most of you, I'm sure, know what the ark is, but we're not talking about Noah's ark, so I need to explain. Remember the tabernacle? The tabernacle uh, had a large courtyard, and at the back of it was a tent divided into two parts. Uh, as you walked into the courtyard, the first thing you found was a brazen altar where sacrifices were offered. Only uh, Israelites could only go that far. Then the next thing you encountered in the courtyard was a laver where only the priests could go and they would wash ceremonially. And then they would go into this tent. The first part of this tent included several pieces of furniture, uh, a lamp stand, for example. And then there was a curtain. And behind that curtain was what is called the ark. Uh, the best way I can describe it to you, you ever... You know what a cedar chest is? I, don't, I haven't heard anybody talk about a cedar chest in a long time. Well, it was that sort of kind, only it had a lid on it, and there were two angels on either side facing each other. And inside that ark, that chest, were things like the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod that budded. Now, that's called the holiest of holies, that room. And that's where God dwelt. So he dwelt in the holiest of holies, and that ark represented as a symbol his presence and his power. As a matter of fact, only the high priest could go in that room, and only once a year. And tradition says, a legend says, they tied a rope around his foot so that if he died in the presence of God, they could pull him out without going in to get him. It was that awesome. No one would ever dare think of moving that ark out of the Holy of Holies. So what they have suggested is extraordinary. But here's the point. They thought it would save them. They're going to go through the ritual of religion to see if that might not help them fight against the Philistines. Now, I can't help but pause and make the point that there are people who have devastating things happen and that's when they decide they want to get religion. But they don't get the real thing. They get into ritualism. I wonder how many believers actually go through rituals to think that uh, that might help them somehow. Uh, matter of fact, uh, one author said, the paraphernalia that modern believers sometimes rely on in place of God include a crucifix, a picture of Jesus, a family Bible positioned conspicuously in the home but seldom read. Others base their hope on spiritual success on a spiritually strong spouse, regular church attendance, or even the daily reading of the Bible. So do you go through rituals and you think, well, that'll help? You know, I, I'm, after all, I go, you're here and you're in church, you know. Or, I, I think uh, when I read this and thought about it, what occurred to me, um, matter of fact, uh, I pulled up at a red light the other day and looked at the car beside me and there was a little statue on the dashboard. 
I think it's a saint. You know, is there a saint that some put on the dashboard and that's going to give them journeying mercies? Uh, or if you don't, if you're not into saints, then uh, maybe a, a good parallel might be I, I'm going to take a trip and I want to have a safe journey. So I'm going to put my Bible in the passenger seat. And then just the fact that I have the Bible, there's going to help me. Now, that's the kind of thing they were doing, only they were tampering with something super special and super spiritual and holy. And they were going to bring it to the site of where they were having the battle. That is unheard of. But they are into religion, only they're into the ritual part of it, not the reality of it. So what happened? Look at verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now, simple. The elders, verse 3, made a decision. And the people, verse 4, carried it out. They went trucking up to Shiloh where the ark was and the tabernacle was and they got the ark and brought it back. But the author sort of slips in the little idea that and oh yeah, Eli's sons were there. Now why would you bring that up? There were all kinds of people in Shiloh. There were all kinds of priests at the tabernacle. Why did he just sort of bend over backwards, so to speak, to bring them up. Well, that just may be the first hint in this passage as to what is really going on. In order to appreciate that, you have to know a little bit about the first three chapters of this book. As we've gone through them, you might recall that Eli was the priest and he had three sons and the text very clearly tells us he had no discipline over them. He had not practiced good parental discipline. And these two sons who were in the family of Levi, the tribe of Levi, so they were entitled to be priests, became priests and they were sinning. They were taking offerings that were given uh, into the Lord and they were taking part of it for themselves. And they were clearly away from the Lord. So that a man of God, we are told, he's not identified, comes to Eli and says, this is so bad that your sons are going to be punished and your descendants are not going to be priests after a while. So in this case, not all cases. In this case, perhaps part of the problem is there is sin in the camp. Maybe the elders sense that. Remember the story of Joshua and Jericho? There was the ark that went around the city. Remember that? Maybe they were thinking if we get the ark in here, maybe like Joshua, Jericho, that'll help. At any rate, behind the scenes is this problem with the two sons. Now, what is going to happen next? Uh, well, you need to keep looking at the story. Look at verse 5. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now, I cannot imagine shouting so loud that the earth shakes. That's obviously hyperbole. But the point is, they got all excited. This is great. The ark is here. And they are saying, it will save us. And they got excited about the ark being there. The ark is going to save us. And they got all excited. Now, I, again, let me pause. I can't help but think sometimes 
uh, people decide they're going to get religion, what they get is a lot of uh, shouting with a loud voice. Uh, that is, they, they, get in, uh, they get all worked up emotionally. That's exactly what's going on here. So we've gone from what I'm going to call today ritualism on one extreme to emotionalism on the other. Ever been in a congregation of saints that got all excited? I remember when I was in college, I went to a Baptist church in Tennessee where they, they got excited every Sunday. That was the whole point. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting excited if it's done right, but that, that was just sort of their... M.O. I mean, if they didn't get excited, they didn't feel like they'd been in church or something. But what hit me is a student, and I was a very, very young Christian at the time. The pastor at one in the service, they all got really excited and they were shouting and screaming all over the place. And he got up to speak and he said, the Lord has descended. I don't need to preach. And I was horrified. But this is the kind of stuff, if you just get worked up emotionally, if you just get excited, if you just get enthusiastic, you got it, let's go. Well, that's where mentality was. They were all excited. The ark is here. Now we'll have victory. The story continues in verse 6. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp. Now, on the other side of the battle line, the Philistines heard them shouting and they wanted to know what was going on. The text doesn't tell us how they found out, but maybe they just listened and they were screaming so loud they heard Wow, the ark is there. And that concerned them. They became at this point aware of the ark of the Lord. But look at verse 7. So the Philistines were afraid and they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe is us for such a thing has never happened before. Interesting. The Philistines just heard that the ark was there and the text says they were afraid. They got concerned that the ark was there. Perhaps they had heard stories of God intervening for Israel and knew that the ark represented his presence and they got concerned. As a matter of fact, verse 8 says, Woe is us, who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Ah, that's exactly what happened. They heard that God, their God, the Israeli God, had judged the Egyptians. And now the symbol of his presence is there and they got concerned. Now what intrigues me is that this happened better than 300 years before. Now think about that. Our country was founded in the latter part of the 18th century. Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. Constitution came a few years later. We're not 300 years old yet. So think back 300 years. Do you remember anything that happened 300 years ago? Probably not. Some people have a hard time thinking about what happened three months ago. All right, uh, sometimes I have a hard time thinking about what happened three minutes ago, but that's another problem. They, they knew that the God of Israel had judged the Egyptians. And so when they heard that the ark was present, they were afraid. Now, there was a custom in ancient times for the people to bring their idols to battle. As a matter of fact, if you'll notice, the text says these gods of the, the Hebrews, and it's plural. 
they were thinking in terms of pagans and idols. At any rate, they were concerned because they thought now God is on the scene. So what are you going to do now? Well, that's in verse 9. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. Now, this intrigues me because they knew what God had done to the Egyptians. And they say to one another, look, guys, we're up against it. So uh, <clears throat> we're going to act like men. We're going to go to fight. That's what we're going to do. So with determination, there was another battle. <clears throat> then what happened? Well, look at verse 10. <clears throat> so the Philistines fought and the, the Israel was defeated. And every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Wow. They lost 4,000 before the ark arrived. They lost 30,000 after the ark arrived. That is... Uh, a whole lot different. You can imagine what the elder said this time. Why did the Lord allow this? What is going on? Uh, so they ran to their tents. That's what they did. They went into retreat. They lost the battle. But it gets worse for the nation of Israel. Look at verse 11. Also the ark of the Lord, uh, the ark of God was captured and the two sons of Eli died. So this is the ultimate result that the ark was captured by the Philistines. Unbelievable. The ark, the most holy thing in all of Israel, except for the scriptures, is now in the hands of the Philistines. And Eli's, uh, Eli's sons Died, just like the man of God previously had prophesied. At this point, let's just recap. <clears throat> they are having an, a defeat. And they decide, we got to get religion. Get religion involved. Get the ark in here. And when it came, they got all excited. And I am going to suggest that neither ritualism nor emotionalism saved them. It got worse for them as an army, for Eli's sons as individuals, and for the nation of Israel in that they lost the ark. There's more to the story. Look at verse 12. Then a man, then a man of Benjamin, that is the tribe of Benjamin, ran from the battle line the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now, what's happened is he's gone from the battlefield back to Shiloh. Who is at Shiloh? Well, the tabernacle is there, what's left of it. And Eli is there. And so this messenger from the tribe of Benjamin, goes back to tell Eli what has happened. But he comes in, and his clothes are torn, and there's dirt on his head. Now, if you know anything at all about the Old Testament scriptures, you know that that indicates that there was mourning, that you, they tore their clothes and put dust on their head. This is a sign that he's in great, great mourning for the death of Eli's sons and for the national calamity that the ark is now in the possession of the Philistines. So verse 13 says, Now when he came there, Eli was sitting on a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city 
cried out. Eli's sitting in the tabernacle. He's watching. He's a priest. And he's concerned about the ark. He knows how important this is. And he's very concerned. And the whole city finds out what has happened with Eli's son, with the battle that lost 30,000 men. And for that matter, the ark is now in the possession of the Philistines. So the whole city is now in mourning. Verse 14 says, And when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this turmoil mean? And the man, that is the messenger from the tribe of Benjamin, came quickly and told Eli. And Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were dim, and he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he says, what happened, my son? Eli is getting the message, but he's getting it slowly. The man identifies himself as where he's come from. And Eli interrupts and says, what's happened, my son? Verse 17 says, so the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your son, uh, Hophni and Phinehas are dead and the ark of the Lord has been captured. So Eli gets the message. I mean, it's a it's a heavy, heavy tragedy. He's a priest, and his number one concern as a priest is that the ark is gone. Then he's a father, and he has two sons, and he's now been told they died in battle. And then there's the whole issue of, as far as the nation is concerned, they got defeated. So this is a very, very heavy blow to Eli. So verse 18 tells us, Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off his seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy and he had judged Israel for 40 years. He was so stunned, some suggest he was sitting on the magistrate's seat, he fell off of it. His weight is an indication in his case that there was self-indulgence. And But what he was concerned about most was that the Ark of the Covenant of God was gone. So the writer is careful to record the news that the Philistines captured the ark and that the two sons had died. But what concerned him was the ark was gone. That was his major concern. Now there's more to the story. We're not done yet. Look at verse 19. Now his daughter-in-law, uh, this is uh, uh, Phineas' uh, wife, was with child, due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth. And for her labor pains came upon her. So now Eli's daughter-in-law, who is pregnant, Here's the news. And again, it's a triple whammy. But notice again, it underscores the ark. She was concerned about the ark as well. But of course, now she's been told her husband has been killed and she's pregnant with his baby. Josephus says that this was, she was seven months pregnant. If that's the case, this was a premature birth. 
At any rate, she gives birth. And verse 20 says, and about that, the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, do not fear for you've born a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured and because her father-in-law and because of her father-in-law and her husband. Now, as I've gone through this passage, it's evident that what's being highlighted is the fact that uh, the ark was gone. Notice how Eli became concerned of the ark. She became concerned of the ark. The ark is a big deal in this passage. And in this book, I might add, we're going to hear more about it later. But the point is that she names her son Ichabod. Can you imagine what does Ichabod mean? Can you, are you going to name your son Ichabod? Every time he runs around, what's your name? I'm Joe. What's your name? I'm Jill. What's your name? I'm Jack. What's your name? I'm named Ichabod. <laughs> what does Ichabod mean? And Ichabod means, you ready for this? No glory. I uh, sometimes talk to my wife about the Sunday sermon. And I went to her and I said, hey, let me bounce off of you some of the things that's in this passage. And we talked about this passage. And I got to the fact that he was named Ichabod. And my wife looked at me and said, in what chapter does he go to counseling? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? And they would know the Hebrew meaning of the word and they would hear Ichabod and think, no glory? And that's the point. No glory. The glory of God has departed. So verse 22 says that. The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God had been captured. So the real point of this story, a big issue in this story, is that the ark of God has been captured by the Philistines. And we need to talk about this for a minute. I suppose most Israelites evidently thought that since Israel had lost the ark, they had lost God and that's not quite what's going on here. Uh, what they lost was God's presence in the sense of God blessing them. That they did not lose his commitment to them. And in the overall scheme of things, they didn't lose his presence because after all, he's omnipresent. But this is bigger than Eli. Eli and his sons are the focus of this passage. But you will recall I said that this is still in the period of the judges. And remember the point of the book of Judges? There was no king in Israel and everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. So this is a time in Israel's history where there is widespread departure from the Lord. So Israel is in a state of lawlessness. Does that sound familiar? And the priesthood was involved. It wasn't just the people. It was the leaders, as in the case of Eli and his two sons. And so then, on top of all of that, they take this most sacred thing, the ark, and they use it like a... Good luck charm. That's what it amounts to. We're going to bring it and it is going to save us. So God, God's glory departed. So that is what is going on here. To the pagans, it was inconceivable that gods could be taken into exile. Uh, I'm sorry, I should say it is conceivable that gods could be taken into exile. But Israel should have known that there was still the omnipresence of God, even though this relic 
was gone. Now, that's the story, but I think we need to probe this a bit because I think there's something here for us. The sum of the story is simple enough. When the, when the Philistines defeated the children of Israel and captured the ark, Eli died, his sons died, his daughter-in-law died. She gave the birth to a son that they called Ichabod. And the Philistines captured the ark and the glory of God departed from Israel. Now, I want to clarify something. The glory of God indeed departed from Israel, but not because of the ark of God was captured, but the ark of God was captured because the glory of God had already departed. Think about it. I have described the sin of the nation of Israel, the sin of Eli and the sin of his sons, all that happened way before the ark was taken from Shiloh to the battlefront. That's the problem. In this case, they ask, why, Lord, the defeat? And the answer is, because of your sin. Because you, you left the Lord out. And that's the issue. You say, wow, even down to death? I mean, 4,000 and 30,000, that's 34,000. And the priest and his sons and his daughter-in-law, a lot of people died. Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that can mean premature physical death. The verse that clearly states that the most is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where the church at Corinth was observing the Lord's table but they were doing it in an unloving way. Some were even getting drunk at the Lord's table. That's like us having lunch after the service and some people getting drunk at lunch at the church. That's what was going on. But what was worse, in a sense, is that some of them were gorging themselves with food and others were starving so that they weren't sharing their food and acting in a loving way. And Paul, in the strongest terms, writes 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and says, What you're doing is not the Lord's Supper. You've missed what this is all about. And for this reason, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you are asleep, which is a biblical word for dead. So there is, according to the New Testament, a sin unto death. There are some situations in which a saint can sin and God say, enough already, you're coming home now. And that's the sin unto death. And the great statement of that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I think that's what happened here. The nation had departed from the Lord. The priest in this case had departed from the Lord. And the elders came up with a stupid idea then we're going to bring the ark down and it is going to save us. Everything is wrong about this. So why did the Lord allow this to happen? Well, I think gleaning from this chapter, you would say because there was sin in the camp. There was sin in Israel. There was sin in the priesthood. That sin is sometimes the cause of tragedy to you personally. And that sin can affect others. And that's what I think is going on here. But let me go one step back from that. Step back for a second. When there is sin, what's really going on? Well, may I suggest that the glory of God had departed before the ark was captured by the Philistines. That the idea is they first departed from the Lord. Then they sinned. And then the glory of God departed. Had they just stayed with the Lord, everything would have been different. But they didn't. They left God out. Then there was sin. And then there was Ichabod. No glory anymore. In John chapter 15, Jesus talks about what you need to do to become a disciple. 
And he says, abide in me. He says, if you abide in my words and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you want and it'll be done to you. You'll produce much fruit, more fruit, and that will bring glory to God. So the real issue is not just the ark. It's the relationship with the God of the ark that they left the Lord out. And that was the problem. Ritualism is not the problem. It's a relationship with the Lord. Emotionalism is not the problem. It's the relationship with the Lord. Those things are fruits of leaving God out of your life. Or your situation. So when things go wrong, when there are negative things that happen to you, there are a whole bunch of explanations for that. I'm not even remotely suggesting this is the only one. But it is one that you ought to consider. I mean, for example, Eli had undisciplined sons because he left the Lord out of his parenting. Eli's sons prematurely died because they left the Lord out of their priestly service for him. Possibly. You are having financial problems because you've left the Lord out of your finances. Maybe you have marital problems because you've left the Lord out of your marriage. Perhaps you're having problems with relationships because you've left the Lord out of that area of your life. You leave the Lord out and there will be problems. Amen? Let me explain something. You were created. You're a creature. You were created. Why were you created? We were created to have a relationship with the Lord. And if that aspect of your life isn't there, then you're not going to function like you were designed to function and you're going to have problems. You get here today in a car. What was it designed to do? Run on four wheels and run you around, right? Well, if you leave part of that car off, it's not going to function right. Just, just take one tire off. That's all. Just take one tire. You're not going to go very far. It's not going to function. That car was designed to run on four wheels and you take one wheel off and you are going to have trouble. You and I were designed to have a relationship with the Lord. And as long as we abide in Him, John chapter 15, we'll produce fruit and glorify Him and be His disciples. You leave Him out and there's all kinds of trouble. But that's the root of the problem. And the fruit is all the trouble that we experience. The story is told of two brothers, ages 8 and 10, who are always getting into trouble. Their mother sort of ran out of possibilities, and she decided to take them to the pastor to see if he could straighten them out. The pastor agreed to talk to them one by one. So one sat outside his office while the other came into his office. The one who was in his office was asked by the pastor, where is God? And the boy's eyes opened kind of wide. Uh, he didn't answer. So the pastor asked again, more forcefully, young man, where is God? And the boy began to squirm in his seat. So the boy asked another time. And this time a raised voice. Young man, answer me. Where is God? At that point, the little boy leaped out of his seat and ran out of the office to his brother who was waiting. And his older brother uh, said to him, 
Well, what, what's the matter? To which the younger brother replied, we're in big trouble. God is missing and they think we did it. <laughs> you know, that just says it all, doesn't it? When the Lord is missing, you did it. Let's pray. Father, what an awesome, awesome possibility we have to know you and abide in your Son and your Word. Lord, we're so grateful for that. Would we confess that there are times in all of our lives when we forget you and leave you out. So Lord, impress upon our minds that the real object of life is to develop that relationship with you. And Lord, thank you for that possibility. In Jesus' name, amen.